evening. It is, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. As I say, it mirrors two of my loves because uh, long before I ever worked here at the museum, I spent uh, 12 years working for the City of Troy at their Nature Center. In fact, one of my former junior naturalists is here tonight. He is now a foot and a half taller than I am. And I think I met him when he was, what, eight? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, long time ago. And I, I feel still more comfortable in hiking boots and, um, and, uh, and a denim shirt and uh, muddy shoes and muddy jeans than I do big girl clothes. But uh, I have a strong um, affiliation with, with uh, Stony Creek Nature Center and the Metro Parks, which are a tremendous resource that I hope you take advantage of this summer. And Mark Sabo, who is on their staff, is also a, an authority on the Voyageur era. Um, Mark, like me, has his roots deep as a naturalist. His dad is a, is a very well-known naturalist in Ohio, where Mark grew up. Uh, he graduated with a degree in environmental interpretation from Ohio State University, and we will forgive you for that. <laughs> I should have brought my bucket. <laughs> we, we have some Ohioans here, so, so we love Ohio. Um, he began his career with the uh, Harris Clinton National Parks at Kensington, back in 1981 when we were just babies, <coughs> just, just little kids. And he's been working with the Metro Parks ever since. One of the great things about working um, in places like Stony Creek Metro Park is they also have wonderful wetlands, and one of their programs <coughs> is to take people out on Voyager canoes, the great big Montrealers, uh, which gives you a taste of what it's like to be in one of those wonderful crafts that the Voyageurs used when they were flying the Great Lakes um, over a century ago. And so Mark, as a typical interpreter, steeped himself in that knowledge and understanding and found, as I have, that when you marry history and nature, you get the richest interpretation possible. So would you please welcome with me tonight, Mr. Mark Zabel. And Rainey will have to bring the Randy, you'll we'll have to bring that uh, screen back up then again. So, it, but thank you so much. Then I'll give my introduction here. Well, bonjour, everyone. You can remember me as Mac from the park. My last name's Hungarian. No, I'm not French. It's Sabo. Uh, but you know, to say bonjour sounds much better than saying how are you in Hungarian, which is hujvuj. <laughs> so, well, a long time ago. I was working as a part-time naturalist for Columbus Metro Parks at a place called Blendon Woods. And um, one day I was getting ready to go to a different park to do a special nature program that I did with a, a fiddle, uh, a violinist and I, where I play guitar in, in the woods. And I was getting ready to go to this park that I'd never done a program at before. And in walks this man about 80 years old, hair down to here turned out to be Walter Tucker, the founding director of the Metropolitan Park District of Columbus and Franklin County. And I thought, this isn't fair. He retires, grows his hair down to here. Before I got that job, I had to cut my hair that was down to there and <laughs> move it, you know. But he said, so what you doing over there? And I told him. And he asked me, so did you know there was a sawmill over there at one time? And I said, well, no. He said, why? History is a big part of interpretation. Go, oh. But to be honest, I didn't really think about it at that point in time. I mean, I expected to be teaching people about geology and wildflowers, leading bird walks. I had no idea how big of a part history would become in my job as I taught even preschoolers about the natural world. When I came to Stony Creek Metro Park, here's this house that served as the nature center for 45 years. They knew very little about the Hodges family that once weekend there. But eventually, we got around to doing some research and was quite surprised. What, I was quite surprised what we found out. As we take these school groups on nature walks down that short trail called Reflection Trail, we cross over Stony Creek. I often talk about how they're going to drink that water. Cuz, could you help me out? Repeat after me. Stony Creek's connected to the Clinton River. And the Clinton River's connected to Lake St. Clair. Lake St. Clair is connected to the Detroit River. 
<laughs> Detroit River's connected to my faucet. <laughs> it's all about connections. And history is a way, great way to connect people to the site. Because there is a pond we come to next. And I say, you're about to see a birthday present. Well, they come up to the pond and they go, where's the birthday present? Well, they're looking at it. The pond was a birthday present from Lizzie Hodges to her husband, Charles Hodges. And they were a Gross Point family who weekend there. Basically, they're walking through a backyard that has gone wild. Now, you go to the Henry Ford Museum and you see that huge locomotive that's all so impressive. Well, you didn't have to get out of that locomotive to oil all those wheels. No, there was an automatic lubricator that did that. That was the Detroit Lubricator Company, Charles Hodges Company. And for a while, on contract, Elijah McCoy worked for him. And we say to this day, now that's the real McCoy. Uh, so all these connections all of a sudden. And it really got to be exciting. And to be able to tell these things to people, it was a way to connect people to the natural world. And there's more I could tell you about uh, Stony Creek Metro Park, and maybe we could save that for another program. But as we built the new nature center and had to tear down the old because of perpetual ice dams and rotten studs, we had to think about how could we glue all this history together and meld it with the natural world? So we picked a theme, Waters of Change. And we begin with the glacier shaping the land 10,000 years ago. The reason why at Stony Creek Metro Park there's land south of 26 Mile. I mean, why, why did they bother to do that? Why did they just make the entrance north of 26 Mile? We got this little square in Shelby Township. The reason is is because when you drive up there and get out of your car and on a clear day stand at that park office, you see these towers in Troy over here. You see the Fisher Building. You see the Renaissance Center. You see the Macomb County Jail. You, and that was all because of what the glacier did. It was moving forward, but melting back at the same speed and like a conveyor belt, moving the rocks, sand, and gravel, shaping that land with this tremendous vista. Well, as people arrived, to hunt the mastodons that were 8,000 pounds, to hunt the beavers that were six feet long. They came across that spot and they, they had this tremendous vista. Thanks to the Inwood family, we have this wonderful collection of artifacts, some of which I brought tonight to show you, that, um, well, the three Inwood brothers that farmed in that area, these artifacts got passed on to their descendants and then donated to us. So again, we've got the glacier, we've got the artifacts, We've got the vista. But then there's something else that has happened over the years. You look at the, oh, those old shots of the Hodges and their little weekend retreat, and you see these elm trees. And you all remember, I oh, know not all of you, but many of you, remember what happened to the elm trees. Good example of globalization. The elm logs were brought from Europe to be made in a veneer. Bark beetles escaped and spread this fungi that eventually hit all of our elm trees. They get to be this big and they die. The very elm trees that covered the homes of the Huron people, the longhouses, they never get that big anymore. Something that I witnessed as a little boy, my father witnessed the loss of the American chestnut, my kids have witnessed the loss of the ash trees, the three that were in the backyard. People come off of our trails kind of disgusted sometimes now because our insurance company requires us to cut down these trees along the, that, that die next to the trail. And yeah, I'm sad to see that. But let's go back. Let's go back to 1800. Those ash trees weren't there. As you stand there at the window of the Nature Center and look out at this woods, that wasn't there. Only big oak trees, 10 to 20 per acre. It was an oak savanna. It wasn't a forest. It was prairie plants with scattered bur oaks, white oaks. What happened? They finished the Erie Canal. That changed it, because now the New Yorkers could come and settle. What kept that in Oak Savannah were fires that would sweep through periodically, maintain that grassland. And these oak trees are resistant to fire, so they could survive that. But here come the New Yorkers. They had this problem with fire burning down their barns. I mean, they didn't want that to happen. So they started fighting the fire, 
the fires that would come, and thus the forest started to grow. It's all about this change that is constantly, constantly taking place. I don't like the idea of losing the ash trees. Again, it, it's allowed us to have cheaper DVD players, products from China. I feel that before those things were shipped, put in package containers, those pallets that brought those beetles here, they should have been inspected in China as an agreement through diplomacy. But it was another mistake that was made. But in the big picture, it's part of that change. When you step back and look at this whole span of history, you think, that started here when the French came and brought disease to the native people. But at the same time, we think of that as something bad, but there were a lot of wonderful things that came out of that, that meeting of these two worlds, of the, the French and the native people. We talk about how the native people were changed forever, never to be the same, but wait a minute. The Europeans were changed forever as well. And there were some ideas from our native peoples here that made their way to Europe that helped to sow the seeds of democracy. And this is something that we haven't talked about until really the last 50, 60 years because it was always just considered manifest destiny. But now we're starting to reconsider history. So when we learn about the voyageurs, the beauty of it is it helps us see the native people through their eyes, how they became part of that culture. And to this day, as you go down this list of settlers that came here from France, became part of what became Detroit, a lot of these people, they're still here. And they're part Ottawa, part French, part Ojibwa, part French, part Huron, part French. This marriage of the cultures. When I go to schools in the area like Bemis and Barnard and Wass and give this very program, you're going to see. I talk about how the French is part of your, is part of your everyday life. About the vivre noir. Oh, excuse me. You say liver noir. The declandre. 2001, I drive into the park, and here's this big sign, Welcome Livernoy Family, 300th Family Reunion. I thought, 2001, 1701, makes sense. So, it's, it's been a wonderful story doing these programs on the canoe and, and teaching people about the voyageurs. I want to give you some idea. Now, why, why did the voyageurs come to this land? One of the main reasons, huh? What was it for? Ah, why? What fur? So think about it. So people could walk down the street like this. Oh, yeah. Can't blame them. They had been peasants for so long. Now that they made it to the middle class, they said, look at me, I'm successful. It's incredible what it took to turn this fur into a beaver felt hat. And maybe I could talk about that a little bit later. But people died in the process of doing it. A mercury poisoning, lost their minds. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. But... Um, Oh yeah, this quest for beaver fur was a, a very strong quest, and it went on for 300 years. Now, to be efficient, you need a large craft to do this. And the canoe was an invention of the native people. And I wanted to give you an idea how big these canoes were, because I couldn't bring ours with me today. Um, we're not talking about little canoes. We're talking about canoes that carried three and a half tons. 7,000 pounds, the weight of a Hummer. And they were delicate. So it took a lot of skill to know how to, uh, how to maneuver these canoes. Look at me, everyone. I am 50 years old. I am an old man. There were voyagers that lived to be 70, but most of them, no. This would be considered old. So, wow. Well, I'm going to have a, can somebody take a Walk me. Thank you, man. If you could just walk this back there and let me put my little microphone back on here. Give everyone an idea. You know, aren't you going to be like the kids at the schools and, and grab, it, grab at the string? <laughs> Isn't this amazing? Keep going. <laughs> this is the, wow, beautiful. This is how big those Voyager canoes were. 36 feet, 600 pounds, 800 wet. Imagine 12 men. Look at me again. I am not built like a voyageur. I'm the opposite. No, they were five feet tall, five foot two, very stocky, 130 pounds of muscle. Thank you so much for your help, man. You just set it down and I'll 
just pull it up here and we'll fold it up later. So, you know, if I was a real voyager and standing here now, you know why you wouldn't be sitting there? <laughs> yeah. To use the imagination to think of what life was like. And I know when we do these programs for kids, that's what we stress. It's not so much knowing the facts. It's getting a sense of what understanding, truly getting a grasp of how good their life is, how their problems aren't really problems in the big picture of things. This is what I try to do with history programs. It's not about memorizing dates so much of really getting a sense of how good life is. And then if they want to memorize the dates, that comes later on. I hope you enjoy Lives of the Voyagers, and I'm going to get started now. Thank you so much. Do we have the lights on? The house lights? So this is brought to you by the Huron Clinton Metro Parks in Stony Creek Metro Park. Huh. I will pluck your head and your head, Lark. Oh, Lark. Oh, gentle lark. Oh, lark, I will pluck you. Oh, lark. Oh, gentle lark. Imagine they're paddling the canoe singing this. I will pluck you. I will pluck your eyes. I will pluck your eyes. And your eyes. And your head. Lark. Now, it's really cute when you walk into a school and you hear a music class, little six-year-old singing this. <laughs> yeah, the, the, no idea what they're singing. Well, the lives of the voyagers. Our story begins when, when Michigan was this great, great wilderness shaped by the glacier. For 12,000 years, people were living here. It was a thriving civilization of native people. Thriving, complex civilization. They started out hunting mastodons, beavers, big beavers, six feet long. Climate changed, and they adapted to that changing climate. By 3,000 years ago, the biggest change of all came. They learned how to farm. And because of the farming, of growing the corn, the beans, the pumpkins, the squash, they had more food. Thus, they no longer had to continually move to find food, because they were no longer just hunter-gatherers. This is when permanent villages emerged. About 1,500 years ago, the bow and arrow was invented. Before that time, spears were thrown with a device called the atlatl that I'll demonstrate to you later. So when you find what you call an arrowhead in this area, it's not an arrowhead, it's a spearhead. Because arrowheads are generally quite small, the size of a thumbnail. And uh, so yes, this was a new invention, this bow and arrow 1,500 years ago. Every society needs something to store things in, some way of attaching things together. And that's what the, where the muckucks come in, these birch bark containers, or in this area, elm bark containers. Now, even though they grew a lot of their food, well, they still hunted, they still gathered. The beaver was among one of the most important animals in that wilderness. It was usually November when they went out to hunt the beaver. And to this day, November in native society is called the beaver moon. It's when the fur is new, the fur hasn't had, any, uh, hasn't had a chance to wear out, and it was a time when they could break into the beaver's lodges with spears, break into the ventilation shaft to spear them, or as the beavers escaped, they would, they would spear the men. They'd use their dogs to help them capture the beavers. To a lot of people, this is brutal, but as I explained to students at schools, that beaver is their Kohl's department store. That beaver is their grocery store. It's like when I used to go to my grandma's house, five years old, you'd pull up in the driveway, the chicken came out of the chicken coop when she saw you had come. You didn't have to call first. She'd get mad because you were calling long distance, wasting money. So you could just pull up. That chicken was on the table in two hours. I saw how something came from the earth and became our food. And this is something that you know, younger people especially have a tendency to be kind of out of touch with. So we stress that. And yes, they killed more beavers than they needed. But that, they didn't go to waste. They would trade among themselves. If you look at an old... Uh, map of native trails in this area. You see Woodward Avenue, Grand River Avenue, Gratiot, 
Jefferson, Michigan Avenue, the Great Sauk Trail that went all the way to Chicago and beyond. These were trade routes that we built our roads on. And these old maps look just like our Metro Park map that I'd like you to take, I mean, coming out from Detroit. So they were traveling a lot, trading these items. Well, in the meantime, in Europe, about the year 1550, this is the kind of hat that was in style, the beaver felt hat. And again, this was status, this hat was expensive, it was incredible the amount of work that went into making something like this. We could do a program just on how they felted beaver fur into hats. Thing is, in Europe, they had beavers, but they were of poorer quality, they were smaller. So the explorers discovered fine beavers in North America. And after sending out very young men into the wilderness to live with the native people and learn their language and to um, teach them how to prepare the furs, that's when the voyageurs could arrive. And the voyageurs were people who paddled canoes. They weren't the actual traders. They worked for companies. And their job is like the truck driver today, to deliver goods. But it was the voyageur that got the traders into the wilderness. And yes, when these two worlds met, it did change life forever. It's never to be the same for either of them. I mean, imagine thousands of years of the Stone Age making tools out of rocks that were dropped by that glacier long ago. And all of a sudden, somebody comes up with this, this wonderful, sharp iron tool. Oh, of course you would want that. So what did we have to do to get it? Well, we have to get beaver first. So there was this great cooperation, this great marriage of cultures that developed. For thousands of years, their containers were clay, birch bark, elm bark. When the French came, they had iron kettles, tin kettles, copper kettles. This was all possible because of the type of technology. If you ever visit Fayette State Park, you really learn about this, how there were cedar trees there that they um, actually cooked in a low oxygen environment to make charcoal. There's the limestone bluffs and there's the iron. And what you do is when you crush limestone and cr with iron ore, heat it up to 2,000 degrees, that limestone chemically grabs that ore from the iron and makes the swag that you put under your uh, brick patio papers there. And uh, then you get this iron. But to do that, you have to make a fire that's 2,000 degrees. Now, there's another way to do that. When you're going over that Rouge River Bridge, and you look to the left, and you see a smokestack with a flame on top. What they're doing there, that's a Coke oven. They're baking coal in a low oxygen environment, turning it into Coke. And uh, Coke is coal that's been changed. My grandpa brought some of this home from the steel mill once. I don't know what he was thinking. He stuck it in the wood stove, the cooking stove. The wood stove started to melt. Um, see, my dad tells this story. See, great histories from your own experiences and your parents' experience. Your grandpa's putting it out, going, yoy, 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 you know, thick Hungarian accent. But um, it took a while to learn how to make a fire hot enough to make these iron implements. So that was the Iron Age now meeting the Stone Age. As we walk those beautiful sand dunes in western Michigan and we get the sand between our toes, um, you know, we don't often think about the impact sand has had. You heat that up to 2,000 degrees, you get beautiful glass beads. Well, this is something that the Europeans could make cheaply and offer the native people. And then, of course, there's the wool blanket. Every spring, the sheep go to the baba shop. <laughs> Sorry. And the wool is shaven off. I get paid to police the public. <laughs> and, and so, oh, you. Okay, I'll stop. Kind of Tourette's syndrome with puns. Huh? Well, anyway, the wool blankets, the beauty of wool is it keeps you warm even if it's wet. And you see the price tag, four points. Now, each point up there doesn't mean one point per beaver fur. Blanket like that would probably be worth six large beaver furs. But it was a way to measure the quality of the blanket. So these are the things that the French brought the native people. Beads, blankets, sugar, to coffee, tobacco, guns, gunpowder, iron kettles, tin kettles. Well, it, what's interesting about this is look at those tin kettles, how they're stacked. Does it remind you of your cupboards at home? Especially if you have a kitchen like mine that was made in 1946, a galley kitchen. You know, our pots and pans are stacked just like this. Big one into a smaller one into a smaller one. Whatever they could do to save room in that canoe to deliver those goods. But again, these two worlds met. 
there was something, many things, that the native people had to offer the French. The technology of canoe building. There are no nails there. And this was a fantastic invention for maneuvering the wilderness, different sizes of rivers, because it could be carried, it could be potaged. So, you take a birch tree, and this is not what they looked like. The birch trees they used were 30 inches in diameter. By the way, when you see a, bir a white birch 30 inches in diameter, the bark doesn't even look like that. It actually does darken up and get gray. They only took the bark above the snow line, which in many places is probably here. So they took the bark from there and up, split it in the springtime, soaked it in water to soften it. I imagine the aerobic bacteria would work on that bark and make it very bendable. And then it was stretched over a frame of cedar. So the native people taught the French how to do this, and I visited the canoe factory at Fort William near Thunder Bay, Ontario, and took these shots. And it's fascinating to know an eight-year-old boy would be working in that factory, perhaps right alongside a native woman being taught by this native woman how to make this canoe, how to sew the bark together using the roots of a spruce tree. So spruce tree roots are very, very bendable. Now, we all know when we take our Christmas tree out or climb an evergreen tree, you get that sticky sap that just doesn't want to wash off. Well, if you cook that with bear grease and charcoal, you get this black stuff that's that was covered over the seams of the canoe to make it waterproof. And that black stuff is called... Oh, man, if we covered these windows, it would be pitch dark in here. To this day, we say pitch dark, pitch black from that old pitch what it is. It's kind of like knock on wood. You're asking the spirits or the tree for a favor. All these expressions that are part of our everyday lives, and it's really fun to, uh, to try to figure out where they come from. Well, these canoes were made in different sizes. Of course, the canoe I showed you was 36 feet long. That was the main canoe used between Montreal, Fort Michel and Mackinac, and Grand, Grand Portage. Um, but there were smaller canoes that went up on smaller uh, rivers way up into the wilderness. So there were also north canoes that were about 25 feet. But what's amazing is the fact that, uh, wow, to have to maneuver this in five-foot waves and to be safe. You know, this painting really captures your imagination of what it was like. When this painting was made, the camera hadn't been invented very long. And we have, a, we have so much to thank Frances Hopkins, the woman sitting there, for these paintings. Because of her paintings, we have a better understanding of what life was like for the voyageurs. Here she is sitting in the canoe with her husband, who is, who is the secretary to the governor of the Hudson Bay Company. And she left us with just a lot of beautiful paintings documenting the lives of the voyageurs. Now, in this particular canoe, they're probably not hauling freight. They're probably hauling just him. It's kind of like their version of a taxi cab. So probably just him and their, and their provisions. Um, but thank goodness that we have those paintings, and I'm going to show you more of those tonight. I've often wondered why we say Mount Pleasant, Michigan. I'm going to have to look into that. Because here's this old French map of Michigan, and they showed Michigan as having mountains in the middle. Isn't that interesting? But you know, you think about how this map was made long before we could go into outer space and look down. I think it's quite, quite an amazing feat. Well, Montreal is the place where the fur trade for the French centered. And um, it's interesting. what's inter interesting about Montreal is uh, beluga whales actually swim up there from the ocean. I mean, here's this island. And, it's, and when you go along the St. Lawrence River, it's huge. You wonder, how could a ship actually sail that far up a river? But the St. Lawrence River is so impressive. But the thing is, they didn't want to come down through Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, because that was getting into Iroquois country, and the Iroquois aligned with the English. So they had to circumvent that. Also, the canoes weren't that great on lakes. So they had to get, let's say, from, from um, Montreal to Fort Michel Mackinac. They went up the St. Lawrence a short distance, and then they went up the Ottawa River. And then they pulled up the Mottawa River, carried the canoe across land to Lake Nipissing, down the French River. And now, when they go across Lake Huron, they always stay close to the shore. This took a month to a month and a half, paddling up to 18 hours a day. You drive there in your car, what is it, eight hours? Uh, you know, rivers just don't go. They go the way they want to go. 
whereas roads, we could blast them right through the hills. So this was quite a feat. And once you get to the um, fort, you've lost a lot of weight if you're a voyager. Might have dropped from 130 down to 120 pounds, and you might have some time to rest. But the ca canoes are unloaded, and then they pretty much turn around within a week or so and head back. Now, one thing about forts, they're not always, uh, mil the military protection is not always the main function. A lot of these forts were very nice. I mean, Fort William, when they stored this trade, these trade items, they showed them off. So people could come to the fort with fur and then pick the blankets, the bolts of cloth that they needed. So you think of a fort as kind of a grungy place, but no, some of these forts I visited, I was quite impressed with really how nice they are. Now, in this case, the North Canoe is going to take the trade items farther into the wilderness. And the reason we know that is these voyagers are wearing plumes in their hats. You're not allowed to wear a plume unless you're very experienced and you've been up into the, towards the Athabasca country of Saskatchewan and Alberta. So those were the ones that got to wear the plumes. The other voyagers returned back to Montreal with the furs where they would be loaded on the sailing vessels and then shipped to Europe. And one thing I always want to stress with, with, uh, with the younger kids is that they didn't paddle the canoes across the ocean. Wouldn't be a real good idea. But I'm not an actual reenactor, um, but I've met many. And I met a man one time at the, it was when we were celebrating the 300th anniversary of Detroit, the landing of Cadillac. He told me in the 19, early 1970s, they paddled a North Canoe across Lake Michigan nonstop. Took them 21 hours. Ah, youth, huh? So it's, wow. But typically, those canoes, they try to avoid the waves and the wind. Now here, the Voyager wants to sign on with the company. And again, the Voyagers worked for a company. There's another group of people called the Courier du Bois, which were illicit traders. They worked for themselves. And in many cases, they were doing this illegally. But the advantage was they could make a lot of profit. And at the same time, they did play a role in getting native people used to the Europeans and, and teaching them the language and such. But this man is going to sign a contract. Problem is, he probably doesn't know how to read or write. So he'll make an X. This man is the company clerk. He's very well educated, and he's studying to actually be a bourgeois. The bourgeois were the stockholders of the fur companies. And this man here is his friend. He likes to smoke the pipe, see? But you see the voyagers, they seem to like to smoke the pipe. So as soon as the snow and the ice melts in early May, they'll say goodbye to their families. You notice when you watch a movie nowadays how it just drives you crazy sometimes because it's so like fast action, bam, 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 things coming at you. What I try to tell many of my audiences, especially the younger people, is to just stop at this picture and look. No, it's not moving, but it's not boring. If you really look at this picture, you could tell so much just from it. Number one, they wore, more, wore many different types of hats. This man was obviously a company representative. Uh, this man has a token. See, he likes to smoke the pipe. He's a man who likes to smoke the pipe. Uh, I see it's after 1763. The British are in charge. These guys are probably actually working for um, the Northwest Company, which would be uh, Scotsman. James McGill, as in McGill University in Montreal. They were in the, in the fur trade. They ran the Northwest Fur Trading Company. One thing else you could tell from this picture is it's not just one canoe by itself. There'd be a whole brigade, maybe over 10, all traveling this route together. The Voyager wore a loose, wore a loose shirt, real baggy under the armpits. There was an extra piece of cloth there called a gusset, and that way he could paddle freely. The Voyager, in this case, has linen or canvas leggings, but originally they dressed like the native people. That's one thing the French became assimilated into this native culture and vice versa. So they understood that if this kept the thorns from scratching their legs, or kept the thorns from scratching the natives' legs, it would certainly work for them. So the leg leggings were typically deer skin. Moccasins were elk, maybe bison skin, something a little thicker. You know when you get your shoes wet, how they get stiff? Moccasins would get wet and stiff, and once in a while they'd take them off and have to give them a bit of a chew. Let that saliva soften up the moccasins a little bit. So different standards of hygiene. But then again, there weren't a lot of people around. You know, as you increase population, you increase disease. So maybe it wasn't that big of a deal for them. 
You know when you go on a vacation, all the stuff that gets put into the car, you think, do you need all this stuff? Well, if you're not concerned about how you smell, you're not going to take a lot of changes of clothes. Voyager, one extra pair of pants, one extra shirt, a knife, a cup, a pouch for tobacco, and this blanket's a three and a half points, so that's probably an 1800 worth, uh, oh, four or five beaver furs. And see this striker here? And this stuff. What's this rock called? Bop, bop. Flintstone, meet the Flintstone. Okay, you got, okay, okay. All right, let me show you something. And Rainy, I promise I won't burn the place down. Iron against the flint, sharp piece. I can make a fire just as easily this way as I do with a match now. I'm not gonna do that in here. I'm just gonna show you the sparking. Ooh. Each spark's 5,000 degrees, and it's actually peeling away a little bit of iron, a little bit of ore there. What they did was they got that spark to land on a piece of char cloth. As I told you how the wood was baked in an oven to make charcoal, well, they, an old shirt was cut up, baked in this can in the fire, cooked into this char cloth. And just one spark from that flint and that striker onto this char cloth, it glows. If it's good char cloth, no problem, it just glows. So you stick that into your pipe, light your tobacco, or you stick it into like a, a bird's nest made out of linen, and then it, uh, you can make a fire that way. And it's really not that difficult to do. I like to impress my family and friends, <laughs> and I do that. So they had very few personal belongings, but they had more that they brought with them besides their personal belongings. Here's a man who's pretty fancy, isn't he? Here's a company representative, a stockholder. These voyagers might be making $40 to $45 a year in the year 1800. $40 to $45 a year. This guy's making over 1000 Now that's a big difference, even then. So they brought with them company representatives. Oh, and by the way, I should have told you something else. When it comes time to bring that canoe to shore, they can't pull that canoe to shore loaded. They have to load everything out, pick it up so it doesn't get damaged. This man is not expected to wade through that water. He'll be carried on the back of a voyageur. So that's something interesting. You know, we often call the voyageurs the unsung heroes of history. We learn about La Salle and all these explorers. Well, it's the voyageurs that paddled their canoes. And I love this image because here LaSalle's claiming this land as New France. And here's a priest, the cross. And look at this man. I believe these are Ottawa because of the way they wear their hair. Look at the expression the artist gave this man. It makes you use your imagination and think, what's going through his head? Well, one thing is as he looks at this cross, this Ottawa man is thinking dragonfly. That's the native symbol of the dragonfly. So the priests are going to have some difficulty getting this man to understand what Christianity is all about. So again, these are some of the, some of the challenges. If you visit the uh, Bruce Peninsula, you see this kind of beach. That's not soft sand. That's a cobble beach. And they're so darn tuckered out, so tired, they're going to sleep right on those round rocks, right on the beach. They're going to probably fall asleep about 11 o'clock at night. They get up at 3 in the morning. They don't have to wait in line to use the bathroom or take a shower. So within a half an hour, the canoes are loaded. They don't eat breakfast. They just load the canoes. Off they go into the morning mist at 3.30 in the morning. Now the man up front, the Avant, is the most experienced. And he might be training to actually become a clerk, a, rep a representative of the company. So there were times when voyagers could actually move up. Most of them were just happy paddling the canoe, though. And this went on for generations. But this Avant had to know the route so well, he had to know where that rock might be under the water, just this far, just hidden. Because if the canoe w would hit that, and the canoe was sticking down about um, 18 inches, fully loaded, if the canoe hit that, it would be destroyed. It, was, it carried a lot of weight, but it was still fragile. So he had to yell to the man in the back, turn a droite, turn a gauche, turn right, turn left, to steer the canoe around all these obstacles. So it's just amazing the challenges they were up to. But they loved it, as long as you gave them a break every hour to smoke the pipe. Because I told you they like to smoke the pipe, huh? You give them a pipe break.
they'll paddle up to 18 hours a day. Matter of fact, they measured time in pipe breaks. Uh, we will stop uh, for the night after three pipe breaks. So, it's got an interesting uh, perception of time. Now, where would you rather paddle a canoe? Here or here? Ah, well, of course, the river is much calmer and much easier. But they did have to get, come out into the Great Lakes. Now, these men are those reenactors I was telling you about. There are clubs that actually purchase these canoes and they take these old voyager routes. What better way to learn about history than to actually live it? And fortunately, it's provided us, along with Francis Hopkins' paintings, a lot of good, a lot of good pictures to tell this story. Now, everything in life could be a curse and a blessing, all in one package. You notice they keep the land close by. If the wind kicks up, they might have to just go off to the side and camp for maybe even a few days or a few hours. But what if the wind is at their backs? Wow, up comes the sail. At 12 miles per hour, they cruise along, snoozing. Except, of course, for the guy in the back. So life could be, could, could be pretty good. They would get a break. So many things could be, um, start off as a curse and then become a blessing. Now, one thing about the waterfall is the canoe goes over the waterfall. You know, everybody goes boom. You do not want that to happen if you can't get the canoe up the waterfall, even if you paddle very fast. So this was the most difficult part. This is uh, Kakabika Falls. This is the first portage that the voyagers had to do after leaving Fort William in Thunder Bay. A beautiful, beautiful waterfall. Now these trails along the side were quite um, established. So it's not like they usually had to make their way through a place where nobody had ever walked. They followed the trails. Everything was loaded in 90-pound packs. Here's 90 pounds of beaver for actually squeezed into this block. Sometimes they had like maybe less valuable deer skin around it to protect it. A man was expected to carry at least two of those, 180 pounds. Some carried three, which would be 270 pounds. But then again, I got to tell you something. I see this all the time in books, how the Voyager could carry that much weight. There's always, when, with history, you always have to be cautious and open. And I've been told now a couple times, those were troy pounds. You know the old adage, hey, or the old uh, riddle, what's heavier, a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? What's well, a pound of feathers? And some people claim that, that these were actually weighed in troy pounds, which would make that 90 pound pack 67 and a half pounds. But still, three of those for a man five foot two is quite, quite amazing. And that's why they had to have this sash. They weren't just trying to look good. And they did love the color red, but that sash did what that uh, weight belt does for the weightlifter. That sash held in their guts. Because when you lift up that much weight and carry it for many, many years, those intestines start to push out through the muscles of the abdomen and you start getting a hernia, which was a leading cause of death among the voyageurs, the hernia. So they tighten that sash down and off they would go, carrying the load high on their backs and not walking like this. No, no, they're trotting, they're trotting. So here's this Jesuit priest who's along with them and he has no load and he can't keep up with them. So these were strong men. They would go about a half a mile, set their load down, go back and get another load. So if they had a long portage, they would do this in steps. Now, this man is, um, again, a reenactor carrying 300 pounds of flour on his back to torture himself and to give his chiropractor business. And this is called a trump line, a native invention, and that would uh, certainly help move some of the load to the neck muscles. He's actually carrying this probably a little bit low. They would have it perhaps a little bit higher on the back. And uh, again, they were incredible people. Then they had to come back and get the canoe. You had to have men of you know, four men about the same height to carry this canoe and know where you're going and not trip. If you've ever portaged a canoe with a friend in an area you're not familiar with, next thing you know you're off the trail, you're going every which way. So it helps you appreciate they're going up rocky hills or down rocky hills with this very delicate canoe. Well, it's about nine o'clock at night now. It's time to relax, time to bring the canoe in, time to unload the trade goods. The canoe can now become their shelter along with that sail. And now it's time for food. There was somewhat of a limited diet with the voyagers. One was to mix flour and water, maybe an egg if you could find a duck egg nearby and break that up, mix that in, and make this uh, fried pan bread called bannock or galet. 
Um, there usually wasn't time to hunt. It was getting dark outside. Now, if they could, they, they would hunt. Maybe get a turkey or out in the plains, find a deer. But often there wasn't time. So they typically brought all of their food with them. And the main food between Montreal, Fort Michel, Mackinac, and Sault Ste. Marie was pea soup. Dried peas. Each man got a quart a day, poured into a kettle. You take that water right from the stream, cook it with big hunks of fat, of pork fat, little bits of salted pork. Cook down so thick the paddle could stand up in it, and that was their food. As the night fell, it, the, the landscape darkened. Now they had time to relax, tell jokes, and of course, smoke their pipes. But it wasn't always that easy. The next night, they, they had had a bad day and the canoe had to be repaired. So they carried with them a roll of birch bark. They carried with them extra spruce root and a bucket of pitch, or maybe just a ball of pine pitch that they would heat up on the fire. They would sew a patch onto the canoe. They actually could completely rebuild a canoe if it got destroyed right on site. Everything in this area where they were, in the boreal forest, the birch trees, um, the um, cedar and the maple, they could find everything in that to make that canoe to repair it locally. So, imagine sleeping on the ground with nothing but a wool blanket, getting up, doing it again, paddling up to 18 hours a day on a good day covering 79 miles. That's 60,000 strokes of the paddle. Somebody actually counted. Doing this day after day, none of us will ever work this hard. When winter comes, they would fill the canoes with water and sink them so they wouldn't dry out. That would preserve them. And then the voyagers might do different jobs. They might work at the fort sawing logs into lumber to help add on to the fort. Now, does that look like a dirty, grungy military installation? No, these forts are quite, were quite beautiful. And they've been restored beautifully, too, like Michel and Mackinac. We got a church there. And, and again, they were kind of like the Kmarts of the day, or the Targets, or the Coles, where people could come uh, with furs and then get the guns, gunpowder, the other trade items. And then in this fort, the furs were kept safe. Now, again, another thing to point out is they didn't just have beaver furs. There were you know, foxes, raccoon, and there was a fur that was worth more than a beaver, and that was the otter fur. It had a lot of hairs per square inch, so that was highly valued. And then in the springtime, these furs would be shipped back to Montreal. So that was pretty much the, sums up the life of the voyageurs in a very generalized fashion, because as you know, Everything, when you get into it, is a lot more complex than you ever imagined. But to use our imagine, imagination and think of the city, Detroit, how it once looked. A fort along the river, built in 1701. Notice back then there was actually a bluff, see? It was actually above the water quite a ways. Notice around the fort, we don't see forests, we see prairie land. You know, I used to tell kids long ago that in the old days, a squirrel could go from one great lake to the other, hopping from tree to tree, not ever touching the ground. And since then, I've learned that might not be true. There were actually a lot of prairies that broke up the forest in Michigan. And people have written about the prairies that surrounded Detroit. So when we think of Michigan history, we remember the voyager. We stare into his face and see those deep, deep wrinkles from all that sun, those deep wrinkles from standing in the smoke of the fire the smoke of the fire drying that skin out, turning it to leather, so these men could avoid the black fly bites and the mosquito bites. When we think of Michigan history, we remember the native people, who, yes, were impacted by the French, but at the same time, they impacted the French as well with their technological feat, their invention, the canoe. And we also have to remember the beaver, who was almost hunted to extinction so people could have fancy hats. The beaver, perhaps, was saved by, from extinction by a caterpillar from China. Isn't that interesting? Silk hats replaced the beaver felt hats in style. And of course, all because of hats, we have this history. So now Detroit was built originally, modern Detroit. It all began and was built because of fancy hats. Now, if you want to learn more about the Voyager, you could come on a voyager canoe ride with me at Stony Creek Metro Park. Here we are with our day camp kids. This is a beautiful canoe. It's fiberglass, Coast Guard approved. Um, but the size is quite accurate, and it is a nice experience. Along our ride around the island, we see where beavers have chewed on trees. Uh, there is a beaver lodge 
that we can sometimes show people if the wind is cooperative. And we have a great time on this. I dress up like the Voyager. I don't take myself real seriously with it. I'm not, I don't stay in character. I go in and out. And I just feel that the main thing is to make an impression on people, to give them a sense of what this history was, so they can later, they later want to learn on their own. And we really have a good time. There are times I'm out in this canoe and I'm thinking, I can't believe the can be out here. I, I mean, it's wonderful to think that you know, there are other things we have to do in our job, but this is something when you're out there on a beautiful day with a group of people, it's really fun for us to convey this historical information to our groups and to do something so positive. So I hope you can join us for a Voyager Canoe Ride sometime. You can go to our website, www.metroparks.com, and see when we're going to be doing these. We do these for organized groups like church groups, school groups, but we also do these for families and individuals on Friday nights during the summer. So I hope to see you perhaps on one of our Voyager canoe rides, and I hope you've enjoyed learning about the lives of the Voyagers. Merci. <laughs> now to paddle 18 hours a day was not an easy feat. 14 to 18, I mean, you had to fight the boredom, you had to pass the time. So what do you do to pass the time? And what is a way to make a little bit of extra money from the bourgeois? You, uh, you sing, and you paddle the canoe. Now, I'm not going to ask you to paddle the canoe, but I do would like you to clap your hands for imagine paddling to this song. Ready? En voulant ma boule en voulant ma boule, en voulant ma boule en voulant ma boule, de hier chez nous y'a tout n'est en voulant ma boule, de hier chez nous y'a tout n'est en voulant ma boule, avec son grand fusil d'argent, boule voulant ma boule voulant, en voulant ma boule voulant, en voulant ma boule, en voulant ma boule voulant, en voulant ma boule, le fils du roi son vache son. En roulant ma boule, avec son grand fusil d'argent, roule roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule, en roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule. It makes you want to do that. And how am I on time? How am I on time? You're good. Okay. Okay. The beaver fur. You could actually see from my samples here. We've got. Two distinctly different grades. This one is much finer than this one. I'm not sure how they graded this yet. If it was, I mean, you think by size, of course, but there are some that are better than others. Also, there was a time when they preferred coat fur, basically coats that were worn by the native people. They wanted that for hats because the guard hairs were already worn off. And it took a while for the French to learn how to efficiently extract these guard hairs. They would have to send them to Russia and have the Russians do it. And then come them, then they'd come back, which would add greatly to the cost. So eventually, though, they figured out how to do it, how to pluck the guard hairs out. And then that left you with the under fur. And under a microscope, that fur has little scales or barbs, little hooks. You've got to get those hooks to rise up to turn the fur into felt. So the hatter would apply nitrate of mercury onto the fur. And that would make those barbs rise, those scales rise. Ah, and that was called carroting, carroting, because it made the fur the color of your sweater that you're wearing, orange. OK, then they sh after it dried, they shaved the fur off. Then the skin was probably boiled to make hide glue. You know, when you fix furniture correctly, especially antiques, you don't use Elmer's. You use hide glue. Because if you wet hide glue, you can take it apart again, kind of like a violin or a cello. You don't want to use Elmer's. Use the hide glue. So the skin may be just thrown away or boiled in the glue. So now you have this, this, this fine fur. And um, you heat it, you steam it, and that hatter breathes in that vapor. And the mercury migrates to the brain, the spinal cord, and starts to twitch. After a while, he starts to walk like this. No, folks, no such thing as OSHA back then. And eventually, yes, he'd go mad. He'd get to like, I am, you know, forgetful. <laughs> and uh, had trouble thinking. Yeah, he sacrificed his wife so people could have fancy beaver felt hats. Thus the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland. It's wonderful. All these connections. And it's, it's just, I love this. 
I love this kind of job, to be able to make these connections. Something interesting, too, that I don't quite understand. I've never seen it, but they've got all this felt now, all these inner, this inner fur all kind of matted together, or starting to mat together. The man used some kind of bow and introduced a vibration to that bow, and it would make all these little hairs bounce up and down. And as they bounced, they got woven together. So this process of hat making is very complex. I, I, I only know it on the surface. I'd like to see it sometime. So you can understand by the time that man got his fancy hat, it was extremely expensive. Think about the path that it had taken. All the way, maybe as far away as Saskatchewan, Lake Athabasca, all the way to France or England or Holland. What a journey, if it could speak, that, what, that it could tell. I'd like to, um, what happened as the beavers became rare, um, they, did, they could make felt out of muskrats. And it took 10 muskrats to be equal to one beaver fur. There was a time when, you know, Detroit, you all know about the, this great exodus, but Detroit's had other great exoduses. Uh, there was a time when, they, you know, when the British came and conquered Detroit, the, the French didn't want to stay there. They went to Monroe, they went up towards Algonac. If I do a Voyager canoe tour for kids from Algonac, their names are on this list. Many of their names are there. It's pretty interesting, these original settlers in Detroit. So the uh, Monroe French were called the Moose Rats French. And of course, they were Dominus Nobiscum et Confirito Duo. They were what uh, denomination? And during Lent on Fridays, you don't eat. You don't eat meat, but you can eat the muskrat. It is a fish, it is in the water, huh? <laughs> well, I'll never forget the time when I called this school in Gross Point, Richard Elementary. Uh, it's Richard. Oh, oh, I learned who Gabriel Richard was, uh, a missionary who apparently gave the French, this is legend, legend has it, he gave the French permission to eat muskrat during Lent because they were struggling with protein. They were having trouble surviving at times. And to this day, in Wyandotte, there are restaurants, Cola's Kitchen, that serve muskrat during Lent. And of course, the man who owns Cola's Kitchen is, I can't say, remember his whole name. He says, oh, it tastes like duck. You know, they eat the same thing. Well, my, my wife says, it tastes like liver. So, but isn't that interesting, all these? Now, I'm real careful because when I've hung around some reenactors, um, and I mentioned that story, oh my goodness, the one man said, oh, that's not true at all. There's no way that's true. And, and you know, other people say, well, yes, it is. There's a lot of evidence that that's, then you kind of step back because, oh, history, as you know, might know, really gets people worked up sometimes. But isn't it nice to have passion about something as well? So that's how I look at it, keep it in perspective. Monsieur Jeff, uh, would you like to come up, monsieur? Uh, Mr. Jeff is going to help me show you something here. And then after this, we'll pass some more of these items. And uh, I could actually start passing the beaver for now. Start that one in the back, or front, and this one in the way back. Maybe you can pass it back there. And then the, um, uh, there you go. Remember the leggings are made from deer skin. My dad, you know what my dad used to do to me? You know. Sir, you know what my dad did to me, don't you? Tanned my hide. And if you did something really stupid, like have a firecracker blow up in your hand, <laughs> oh, that never happened to me. He'd say, you don't have enough brains to tan your own hide. <laughs> Jeff knew what I was going to say. <laughs> well, the story is, is that, you know, you, an animal usually produces enough brains to actually soften its own hide. The brain has tannic acid. So does that apple when you bite into it and you see it turn brown or the leaf juice that gets into Taquamon and Falls to give it that color, tannic acid. Well, that's what softens the skin, and you have to apply it and do this to it. That's the expression for the tan your... I got my hide tanned every other day. I don't know what I did, but uh, then you have to go like this. So this gives you an idea of what the leggings felt like. If you didn't tan the hide, you'd be wearing a beef jerky. This would be handy if you got hungry, <laughs> but then you'd end up a nudist. So. I'll let you pass that. This is a celt. This is, of the archa this is before the woodland period. A um, transitional item from the archaic to the woodland period found near Stony Creek Metro Park, donated by the Inwood family. So it gives you an idea of something, a gift from the glacier shaped into an ax. I'm gonna start this over here. 
So it's called a SELT. And, uh, oh, Monsieur Jeff, you like to tell these stories, don't you, Monsieur? <laughs> the children come up to Monsieur Jeff and they say, oh, where did you get the bear teeth? And he says, oh, I kill the bear with my own bare hands. Uh, so you like to put those on, Monsieur Jeff, to show them off? Thank you, Monsieur. Now, Monsieur Jeff, you have been a canoe man for how many years? You've been the Voyager. 50 years. 50 years oh. I've been paddling the canoe. The Voyager. He likes to exaggerate, no? <laughs> oh, of course, he likes to exaggerate. 10 years old. 10 years old I was paddling the canoe. Oh, don't, they, don't, you, don't you have to be 13? No, no. Oh, they had papa, you? My papa. Ah, your papa. Wow. <laughs> so now you do not go back to Montréal every winter because um, you got tired of being called a manger du lard, mm. a pork eater. Mm. That was considered the easy journey between Montreal and what's now Michigan. There were 32, 33 portages. That was considered easy. But Michel Jeff, he decided to stay in, and overwinter at the fort. And now he takes the north canoe up into, oh, way up into the north. He might be gone two years before he comes back with a load the fur. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, how many wives have you had? <laughs> I did not count well. Ah. <laughs> but tell me, you're a good Catholic. How? Tra trade relations. Ah, trade. Yes. Mr. Jeff believes in the land of the Les Sauvages, which means people that live in the woods to the French. To the English, savage means people who are not Christian. But to the French, the people that live in the woods. To the, to the French, they feel they should play by the rules of the native land that they're in. So sometimes you get to married and things don't work out. She goes back with the people that is accepted. You may get married again. Oui? Uh, so you have had uh, you have had six wives. How many dogs did you have? Many dogs. Un, deux, trois. Oh, that is that that is known to happen, especially if someone you did not like. You might need the dog. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, dix, onze, twelve dogs. And before winter comes, you capture the fish, you cut off the heads, and you give them to your dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Jeff, the dogs pull your what in the winter? Sled. Ah, oui. And you can go visit the native villages, because you have many friends there. They are your friends. Sometimes you invite them to the fort where you stay. Now, Mr. Jeff does not, he likes to brag, but he is a little bit shy about his ability to play the what? The only, the only fiddle. Ah, but, but Mr. Jeff, who taught you how? It was not the Frenchman, it was a Scotsman. It is the Scots who brought the violin to the French, you know, the French has the squeeze box. Now, Mr. Jeff, he plays that fiddle. He dances like this. He plays the fiddle. Multitasking, huh? And look, he, look, everyone smiles. More <laughs> money for me. I entertain, I tell stories, I sing, I play music. It's worth trade. It's worth being disagreeable. And so the native people who don't always smile easily, you actually get them to smile a bit. So that is the that is why you're not interesting. Huh? When it is zero degrees outside, that is when your sled slides the best on the snow. Zero degrees. The rivers are frozen, the lakes are frozen. I can travel. Yes. I can pull 400 pounds on the sled. The dogs are strong. But in my world, Mr. Jeff, the kids do not go outside. It's 40 degrees and cold. <laughs> Good thing they don't have to go out to the outhouse, huh? <laughs> uh, or go out to milk the cows. It's 4 in the morning. Mr. Jeff, you could make yourself warm with this wool blanket. Mm -hmm. uh, we could wrap you up here on this Ah, uh, that is good, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you have a Mexican restaurant? Search for a burrito. <laughs> oh, really? Say that thing. Oh. Now, Mr. Jeff, some of these have, have these sleeves in it, huh? What do they call down TV Snuggies? <laughs> Those are nothing new. <laughs> nothing new. You see, it's a fine. But how many points does this have? Oh, there it is. This is four points. You know, when you go to the store, they scan. When did they first start scanning in the stores? When computers came, maybe 30 years, 40 years ago, yeah. scanning, barcoding? No, 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 barcodes are 400 years old. The barcoding system. You made a good point. Point. 
points. <laughs> uh, uh, so, Michel Jeff, you are a wonderful voyager, and you have had many great journeys. If you, if you could, if God comes down upon you, upon your death, and says, Michel Jeff, you can come back to life again, what will you be? I will be an evil no. Ah, uh, you were not. Ah. I went to the back country, I spent the winter, <coughs> I developed trade relations, maybe relations with the chief's daughter. You would not want to friendships a bourgeois or no. I ah. count too many numbers. So you have loved your life. I love the life. You have seen beautiful waterfalls, you didn't have to go to mass every Sunday. You would do it all the same way, we do not miss you. Well, thank you, Nelson Mr. Jeff, for coming up and sharing. Also, it's very cold in this region, so we need a wool hat. 
And that's why Cartier sent two young men into the wilderness to learn the ways. Um, so this is what, 1615, is it? Am I right? somebody wealthy oh. over there. Yeah. They had about kind of right now boxes. So you think of 1615 to the end of the 1800s, that's a long time. So this is over a long period of time. One thing I always struggle with, you have to make, you have to package information to make it digestible. But then it's hard to avoid the generalizations as well. So we just have to take it as a given that there were a lot of things, a lot of things going on. And also, originally, they built the fort. Phase one of this trade network consisted of the native people coming to them. And there were even tribes like the Ottawa or the middlemen. Phase two was when they started going out to the people and that eliminated the middleman, increased profits, and the native people actually <coughs> enjoyed being um, greeted on a more individual basis. So remember, there are actually specific phases of the trade process that were predictable that it went through. There was a lot of time for them to just see what was necessary. It's like, it's like the car when it first came out, it didn't even have a top on it, it didn't take off, it had a top on it. Yeah, my mother would go to her, her aunt's house, uh, Zanesville, Ohio, and that Model A it was, it's five miles every other Sunday. And she said it seemed like it took three hours, <laughs> that Model A going down those roads of Southern Ohio. Any other questions? Well, I would, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me. I hope I, I did it 